Welcome, welcome everyone. It's your boy Rafaelito here with another live dad start. There I am with another live dad starting over session, event, live stream, whatever you want to call it. How do you do? How are you folks today? I am joining you again, once again, live from the great Commonwealth of Kentucky. All right, it's enough of that. Um, never gets old. Uh, how are you guys doing today? Thank you all for joining me live. I'm looking over here on my other monitor to make sure everything is cool. Everything is good. Let me refresh to make sure that we are, in fact, good to go on Facebook over here. Facebook sometimes has issues. Yeah, we're good to go. Welcome, everyone. How are you guys today? And gals. Uh, my name is Ralph. For those that don't know, I go by the fake internet name of DSO, which stands for Dad Starting Over. And you can learn more about me, my business, my organization at dadstartingover.com or go to any of my social media channels, including Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, which I am live streaming right now as we speak on all three of those platforms and also Instagram. Uh, am I on anywhere else? I think that about covers it. We uh, continue to do well on YouTube. The membership is growing. Just added a thousand more uh, subscribers last night. No complaints, man. At this rate, we're going to hit a hundred thousand pretty quick. I'm going to have the old plaque behind me on the wall. And uh, we already have a hey howdy. Can hear you on YouTube, says CLD Gaming. Very good. Thank you, sir. And good to see you again. One of our regulars. Uh, where do you, uh, it, something I always ask right off the bat with these. Where are you joining us from? Where are you at? Would love to hear it. I love to see where everybody's at in the world. We usually have folks from all corners of the U.S. and a few international. Um, the dad starting over world market-wise, as far as uh, who buys our products, and we'll, I'll talk a little bit about that before we get started here today, um, who takes in my material, the content, and everything else. The majority are in the States, for sure, but the next biggest group is Australia. We have a big uh, following in Australia, so welcome to all my Aussie friends if you're on here. In fact, I don't know if you can see behind me, I have this back there. I have the... Uh, uh, Boomerang, somebody gave me a little plaque on there. Steve from Australia and our, our good folks at uh, from our uh, uh, Australian contingent chapter, whatever you want to call it, of the DSO fraternity uh, gave me that. So thank you so much. And look at this. What else they gave me? You see this? You're like, what the hell is that, dude? That's kangaroo scrotum. Good way to start off the, uh, the old live here today with some kangaroo balls. But hey, highbrow humor. Here, Dad started over. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Well, we have Trevor Perroton from Mexico. Bienvenidos, Trevor. And Deplorable Millennial from Illinois. Whereabouts in Illinois, Deplorable Millennial? I lived in Peoria for years. Used to work for the Big Yellow Tractor Company there. Big Yellow Machine Company, rather. Uh, the tractor was the other guy. But welcome, welcome, everyone. Um, dadstartingover.com to learn more about me. I'm sure many of you have seen me. If you're like stumbled upon this live and you're like, this guy looks familiar, probably because I have, I don't know, thousands and thousands of videos out there across all the social media channels. On YouTube alone, I have over 800 videos. Um, good. That's probably the best place to watch video. Go to YouTube, search for Dad Starting Over, get some coffee, enjoy yourself. You're not going to run out of material because I add to it every single day. And uh, that uh, following is growing, as I mentioned on there uh, earlier, that uh, YouTube following is growing, subscriber following. Uh, Facebook continues to grow. We're over 141, 42,000 followers, something like that on Facebook, uh, 40 some odd thousand on YouTube, 120 some thousand on TikTok. So growing every single day. So thank you also very much for following. It helps out a great deal, helps keep the lights on. Uh, as well as uh, the purchase of some of my books that I've written. Many people know me by one book in particular, and that book was about sex and marriage. I've written on the topics of, well, over the years, I've talked about uh, divorce and taking care of kids and physical fitness, but when I talked about sex and marriage, people came to life. Sex sells, folks. That's what I've learned over the years. And I wrote a book called The Dead Bedroom Fix. The Dead Bedroom Fix. It's available on Amazon, Audible, Apple Books, uh, where else? Barnes and Noble, all the formats. Uh, yes, I read it myself on the Audible and 
Apple Books audio format, wherever it is. Scribd, I think, is another one. Um, Scribd, is that right? Or is that the program? Anyway, um, I'm big across all the channels and you may have not seen or heard me rather on uh, the dad starting over podcast it's available for the public wherever podcasts are available streamed whatever you can find me um oh look at that we have mr is that rohan rohan I don't know how to pronounce the first name mr but he's joining us from south africa south africa south africa is that how you guys say it south africa i dated a south african chick for a very brief amount of time she was nice um, South Africa has such a cool history, such cool people. Welcome. And, uh, what else? So if you go to dadstartingover.com, you will learn about, um, all my books and you will see, we have courses available on there. We had a course for, you know, coach Vance and our DSO team. He's a PhD Olympic weightlifting coach, and he has a, a course on fat loss, a course on gaining muscle. We have, uh, some, uh, live streams recorded that you can get for like $4 and 99 cents, I believe on um or 9.99 can't remember which probably should know that um sessions i've done with uh, dr psych mom so if you want to help support us both you can purchase those we have one that we've done about uh, life after divorce for men and about how, how to deal with your avoidant wife those are pretty popular so check those out um we also have our private group for men only that's the big thing that i'm most proud of uh we have Within the private group for men only called the DSO fraternity, we have a, a, a private forum, forums plural, technically. We have a, a um, what do you call it, Discord server for our lifetime DSO fraternity members. And they have a variety of forums and sub chats and everything on there, as well as a private discussion group. No one can see what you're typing. No one can see that you belong to the group on Facebook. Very, very active. And we have uh, live Zoom meetings, several of those every single week. We record them all. And you can listen to those recordings right from your phone, uh, as well as a DSO fraternity podcast you can listen to from your phone, as well as my four books that I've written. You get access to them at no additional charge. You can download the PDF if you so choose, or you can listen to the audio book version also from your phone. We make that very simple to do. And we get together in person. We have our uh, fourth annual gathering in the States coming up next month in New Orleans, Louisiana. We call our gatherings in the States BroFest. And our guys over in Australia, they call their gathering Mate Fest. Kind of cool. And uh, those have been very, very popular. Looking forward to that. What else we got going on? I'm going to, um, pardon me for a moment here. I think I do this on every single live stream where I jump over here to my notes and I copy stuff. Copy and paste. This is a link um, for the you on YouTube. Look over at the chat for those on Facebook. Look down in the comments. Um, there's a link to try out our DSO fraternity group one month, absolutely free. If you don't like it, you cancel. If you do like it, stick around and you'll get charged for the next month, the next month. And I'll tell you what most people do is they try it out for a couple of months and they go, can I just pay for a year up front? So I don't have to do this monthly thing. Yeah. And actually it's cheaper that way. If you do it that way, we like knock a month or two off of the price. If you look at it, you know, month to month versus annual or the biggest bank for your buck is the ant or the lifetime rather. And I'm going to type in here, um, 30% off lifetime coupon code. And that is, so if you go to uh, dsofraternity.com, choose the lump sum uh, lifetime membership option, go to the checkout, put in that code FRAT2024, and you'll get 30% off. And that's not, the deal's not going to last forever. I think I'm going to keep it going for the next couple of weeks. So through March, this is in honor of our fourth anniversary with the DSO fraternity group. So uh, very good. Uh, he's, <laughs> Rohan, patience, my friend. I got to get the business stuff out of the way first. He says, are you going to have a QA and a session? You're on it, buddy. I always do the business stuff up front. And then people just start asking questions and we go from there. And uh, let's go up to, I'm going to scroll up to CLD Gaming. He was the first one to go with the question. Hmm. And he is from Australia. And he says, DSO, my sex life has tanked after 24 years of marriage. I'm working on myself, but not knowing when our next bedroom session is making me quite anxious. Sometimes it's a few months between sessions. Well, so 
24 years of marriage, the bedroom's dead. Do you think you're unique in your uh, situation? Um, I think, uh, are you not a member of our DSO fraternity? I believe you are. I apologize, especially with the, the different goofy internet names, CLD Gaming 6. I cannot remember exactly who you are. Even if you gave me your real name, I'd probably be like, because, eh, you know, we have like six, 700 some odd members, whatever it is, um, in the DSO fraternity. So it's a little difficult to remember all you guys. But anywho, Sex Life Tanked. You're uh, Mr. Needy wanting it. I mean, because you're, you're a dude, right? Um, and you feel anxious, like, when's the next one going to be? When's the next session going to be? Hmm, kind of really, really needing it. Sometimes it's months between sessions. My friend, um, when there are months between uh, sexual in- encounters with your wife, are you cool with that? I bet you're not. So what have you done to remedy this? You're talking about, hey, dude, I'm working on myself here, right? How long? What does that mean exactly? Um, do you have stuff up here in the old noodle that you're working on as well as the physicality? Um, I, I wrote in my book, The Dead Bedroom Fix, uh, the importance of being physically fit. And that, uh, yes, looks matter. It's the primary attraction vehicle between two individuals. You know, hey, who's that over there? She's cute. Hey, who's that over there? He's cute. Um, being uh, Taking care of your physicality, building muscles and, and so forth. Your confidence goes up. Um, you feel better about yourself. You're standing tall. You're looking good. You're starting to get attention from others. I, a lot of women kind of roll their eyes at that and go, God, women don't like guys with muscles. Stop it already. Really? Ask any guy who's, uh, let's say, lost a ton of weight and he's building some muscle. How many times some woman came up to him and gave him a honk honk on the arm and say, looking good there, mister. Uh, happened to me as soon as I started gaining muscle. Uh, I had, I, I've told this story before I worked in an office full of women and I started losing weight and gaining muscle post-divorce felt feeling good about myself. And one gal in particular, an older gal, older for me at the time, I was in my thirties and, uh, was I in my thirties? Yeah, I was in my thirties and she, I believe was in her fifties at the time. And, um, she became really, really handsy and really goofy and crossing boundaries and at one point, she walked over and lifted my shirt tail to see my butt. And she was reprimanded for that. So I felt like the office floozy being taken advantage of. <laughs> In hindsight, kind of funny. At the time, it wasn't that fun. It was, it was kind of disturbing. But that was an example of kind of a, a sudden change in my physicality brought out a side in people that I hadn't seen before. And sometimes that is a very positive, sexually positive, good thing in the old mating game thing of, you know, looking good physically. Nothing wrong with saying, if you're a woman, I like a guy to look very masculine, tough. He doesn't, you know, that over the top, roided out bodybuilder look, eh, not so much, kind of gross to most people. But a guy looks like he, you know, fills out a shirt, takes care of himself. Nothing wrong with that, right? That's the sentiment I get from most women. But anywho, if you're like most men, you're saying, I- I'm-, I'm checking that box, the physical, lost a ton of weight, getting some muscle and so forth. Where's my sex? A little bit more difficult than that, especially, mister, after 24 years of marriage. I don't know if you've, you've gathered this from watching my material and others. If you're like a lot of anxious guys who uh, are, are in this relationship talk sphere, you've probably in, it taken in a lot of information, watched a lot of YouTube videos, read a lot of books, so forth, podcasts and everything else. I don't know if you've gathered that um, long-term monogamy marriage over decades, which you've hit that mark, two decades plus, uh, doesn't necessarily equal sexy. Even if you had a really hot and heavy honeymoon period that could last for years, by the way, the more years, kids, stress and everything that build up, the sexy naturally goes down. And yours is, yours is dead, dude. It goes months between sessions. It's dead. So going back to my original point, what are you doing? What, What are you sticking around for? Because there's a lot of other good things going on. Well, as I and our buddy, Dr. Psych Mom, has mentioned, um, the lack of sex in a relationship is the canary in the coal mine for much deeper issues. It is a surface level problem, kind of like, um, oh, I'm, I'm trying to draw a blank here. There, there's, a, there's some physical things that people notice, like I got a little spot on my skin. That's weird. It won't go away. A little mole or something. 
you know, it's not really bothering me. It's kind of itchy. Let me go get that checked out. And you go to the doctor and like, yeah, you have stage four melanoma. It's spread all over. You got tumors in your lungs and so forth. It's kind of like that. You're like, we haven't had sex in months. Yeah, because you have these underlying mental issues. She has these underlying mental issues, emotional baggage, yada, yada, yada. Maybe even physical things, maybe in all this, maybe resentments all the way, not, not to stoke the anxious flames here, but all the way to horrible, horrible stuff such as she's seeing other people. You're seeing other people. Who knows what, you know, financial infidelity, all kinds of awful stuff, which gets in the way of intimacy between two people. Very deep issue, as you know, my friend. Not so simple. Um, I'm going to jump down here to the next question. Mr. Hyden Watch says, does the death in the family, the wife's father, usually increase her desire for sex? In the three to four months following, she's we've been intimate about twice a month, where before it was basically a dead bedroom. But in the last three months, back to normal. What do you make of this? Um, I think a psychologist would be better... Um, suited to maybe describe psychologically the phenomena that you're experiencing here, but just I'm kind of what's spitting in the wind here, trying to uh, figure out what's going on here. Um, the, this isn't your situation, but follow me here. There is a, a scenario known as uh, hysterical bonding, which is when this, the safety sanctity union of two people is really, really threatened. A, a really extreme acute example of that would be one person was caught sleeping around with somebody else. What often couples will report is, oh, wow, we experienced together as a couple. Let's say he cheated, for example. Husband cheated. We decide we're going to work on this as a couple. Then they'll report, oh, wow, we've been so physically and emotionally connected like we haven't seen in years. And this has lasted two to three weeks. You know, the guy will say, uh, I have talked to men, the men I speak to most of the time have been cheated on when it comes to the whole infidelity thing. And they will say, caught my wife in an affair. We agreed to work on it. And it's weird. We've had sex five times this week. I don't know if you've ever had five, sex five times this week of what the hell's going on. Well, it's a psychological phenomenon known as hysterical bonding. We could go on and on and figure out why that is, but it's almost like you're trying to reclaim each other. It's like this, this, um, uh, a drastic life moment has kicked something into gear that uh, ignites libido in people. I, I don't know exactly the mechanism at play. I don't know if anybody exactly knows the mechanism at play. It could vary person to person. All we know is that it's a relatively common thing. So maybe, Mr. Heidenwatch, what you're seeing is something similar to that in terms of maybe this death of father has caused her temporarily, it sounds like, to question life. Um, look, this man in my life died. Maybe eventually I will lose this man. Maybe I need to, maybe this ignites some kind of desire in me, some kind of animalistic deep seated thing that says must do this to retain mate. I'm in danger of losing him because I see how quickly life can slip through your fingers. I, I don't know. But, uh, I, I think the fact that you've kind of tied it to the father dying, I don't think that's a coincidence. So something's going on there. Something that caused her to, like I say, kind of uh, push a button, animalistic biological programming in there somehow that caused the old hokey pokey to increase in frequency and then um, back down to back down to normal. Um, but here's the thing: in three to four months following, we've been intimate about twice a month, where before it was basically a dead bedroom, my friend. Um, in my mind, and probably in the mind of many. Uh, mental health professionals, uh, therapists, sex therapists, marriage counselors, and so forth. If you said, we, we, we're we intimate about twice a month, they would probably go, not great, dude, and, and gal. Um, that could qualify as a dead bedroom in many eyes. Um, I, I saw where somebody tried to clinically define dead bedroom as 10 times or less per year. And I'm like, okay, so it's less than once a month. Um, that the, the definition of, is this a healthy sexual relationship varies couple to couple, obviously. If you're cool with one, once or twice a month, then hallelujah, dude. Who am I to say that's dead, right? Um, but in my mind, I think it needs to be at least once a week just to keep that connection. And I think there's data to prove that, that people that do once or more per week are actually, they, they claim to be happier and better connected. There, there, there's um, something magical 
as it were, that happens when two people become get naked and rub their dirty bits together. They just grow closer together. We know that there's a very real um, uh, uh, biological phenomena at play when two people get together, especially with the woman, where it increases a, a lot of bonding chemicals in the brain, um, which cause her to, quote, fall in love. That is expedited by the, the physical act. So to do that again and again throughout the relationship, you can see how it brings you together. It's a positive thing. Um, so uh, twice a month, eh, not really cutting it, my opinion. Um, and then you say it, it died again, right? So uh, what keeps you around? I, I keep coming back to this. When I have people that uh, come to me and say, we haven't had sex in years or something like that, what keeps you around? And sometimes you get back the, well, duh, dude, we're married. Okay. It's like, we got kids. Okay. Um, there's still something fundamentally broken. And people that try to say, oh, it's just about the old in and out. That's all he thinks about. No, no, that's not fair. It's not healthy. It's not right. Um, the old in and out, it's not about that. It's about the closeness. It's about the connection. And when you guys don't have that for an extended period of time, something is fundamentally broken. Just going to keep saying it again and again. Canary in the coal mine, folks. And Mr. Hide and Watch, you got some really deep-seated issues there you need to work on. And maybe the death of father is the, uh, oh, the like the fire under the butt of the relationship to go. That showed us that it's possible to increase, but it increased at the... Uh, you know, after something horrible, like the death of a, of a parent and then it died again. Okay. We got something's going on here. I mentioned this before. And, uh, um, when was this? I, I talked about this last was it my last live. I, I'm, I do, I'm doing so many of these lives and then I'm doing meetings that they're starting to blend together in my head. I think it was the last DSO fraternity meeting I had, which was yesterday. Um, a, uh, um, a common phrase to use with people that sometimes wakes them up a little bit. To say, hey, you're hurting my feelings, this is wrong, blah, blah, in one ear or at the other. But our situation is unhealthy and it's weird. Two people living together as husband and wife, sharing all these life moments, blah, 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 being partners, having kids, but never touching each other is freaking weird. Sorry. And before you say anything, Mr. or Miss Spouse, the, the dead bedroom person, instigator, whatever, the low libido person to say that before you jump on me and say, no, it's not. I've already consulted with a counselor, coach, internet guy, sex therapist, whatever. And they all agree. Eh, something's up, dude. So wife, what's up? Put the onus on her. Uh, you, you see that I'm wanting a connection with you, by the way, perfectly normal. You see, I'm wanting to make this marriage work pretty commendable, especially for a guy that's been through so much over the months and years of no connection. I have every right just to go, eh, I, this ain't going to work. But instead, I'm working it out. So what do you say, wife? You want to stop with this weird relationship and work on this together? And I'm not saying jump in bed right now either. That's the end game. We got a, we got a lot of work to do here between us. You ready to do that or not? I think the reason a lot of guys don't have that very normal, by the way, powerful masculine talk is that you know what's going to happen. She's going to tell you, go fuck yourself. Ironic. <laughs> and uh, uh, all right, Jamie says, all right, lads, watching from the UK. Well, welcome, Jamie. All right. So we got an Aussie, we got a Brit, and some Americans, anybody else? Um, Hide and Watch says, what keeps him around is his children. Um, by that, do you mean you don't, you want to be in their life 24 7? If not, um, that's just unfathomable for you, unfathomable for you. Well, then is there a solution? Uh, you know, I've had some guys that say, I don't care what you say, Ralph. Um, I'm not going to divorce because I want, I'm going to be the guy to tuck in my kid every day. Not some other dude and not my wife by herself because we're divorced, whatever. I'm going to be in my kid's life every day. And often what these guys say, and it's not a coincidence, probably more often than not is I came from a broken home and I'm not going to do that to my kids. I remember what that was like. And I remember how much that sucked and I'm not putting my kids through that. Sorry. So we need to come up with plan B. Well, there's, a, there's not just plan B. There's plan B through Z, basically. There's a lot of flavors in between for how to get this done. Work it out as a couple. Years of therapy. Yes, years is plural. Let's be honest. Not trying to be negative. That's just not bullshitting you. Um, 
all the way to open relationships. Not a fan, causes a lot of chaos. Good luck with that. Um, but it's a solution for some people. And then all everything in between. There's a lot of different ways to skin a cat here. Hmm. All right. Deplorable millennial says, if my wife is super crabby and it pushes me out of the mood, am I manipulating her by rejecting her? What a good question, my man. Uh, he follows up with, I expect her to accept me as I am. Asking over and over again for me to change. I see that as manipulation. Cool. All right. You, you got two different things here. I'm going to stick with, with question number one for now. That we can go to part two here. Number one is one I hear all the time. And I always think it is so interesting. And I'm not belittling what you're saying here in any way. Don't, don't take it as that. If my wife is super crabby, in other words, she's not a nice person. She's being a dick. My wife's being a dick. And because of that, I'm not attracted to her in that way. Okay, guess what? Welcome to being a healthy human being. When people are assholes, we want to get away from them. Um, a lot of men have a hard time with that. Why? Because a lot of men are kind of nice, nice guy, which is another word for uh, people pleaser, anxiousy kind of guy. I to think that other people don't like me. Everybody's got to like me. I got to like everybody. I got to keep everything, keep the water smooth. I don't want to ruffle any feathers. You know that guy. Women are like this as well. Women tend to be more agreeable than men in that way. Uh, and so, when a lot of these men start becoming mentally healthier more confident, maybe going to therapy, maybe being in our group, dsofraternity.com. Um, and then they see a really ne over the top negative thing from wife. She's throwing things, she's breaking things, whatever it may be. Old him, old needier him would have been like, what can I do to make you feel better? Well, what can, please don't be mean. Don't be mad. Allow me to buy you something, do something for you, blah, 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 blah. And it just makes her worse and makes her more angry. And he's just like, oh, there's nothing I can do. And then he reaches out. You want to have sex? And she's like, what? No, I don't want to have sex. And he's now that he's mentally healthier. He's like her negative behavior actually makes me go. Ooh, well, of course it should make you go. Ooh, that's good, dude. You know, it, it, it's frankly, it's weird using that term again. It's weird to put up with a lot of negative behavior from somebody, a lot of very unattractive behavior. Yeah, let's go there and follow up with you want to have sex. What does that show? It shows that your 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 need for sex is not based upon attraction. It's not based upon a mutual love for the person. It's based upon uh, I I have I'm feeling very needy right now, and and having an orgasm would make me feel better. Mmm, highly unattractive. Not a good place to be. And if that's the source of a lot of your libido, your sexual desire is just make me feel better, please. Mm, not good. Um, I've I've said on here before. Um, I'll have a man who will say, uh, you know, in a coaching session and you can book time with me, dadstartingover.com slash coaching, or just go to the menu, look for coaching a lot cheaper for our DSO fraternity members, by the way. Um, yeah. Why are we chatting mister? And he will just go on and on about how he does not like his wife. Oh my gosh. She gained a hundred pounds. She wants, she will have nothing to do with the gym. She won't stop eating junk food. She drinks like a fish. When she gets drunk, she's screaming and yelling and she's angry. She's scaring the kids. She's scaring me. I'm trying to keep things calm. Um, uh, who knows? Just all kinds of horrible, terrible behavior. I'm sorry to hear that, mister. What, so how can I help you? Well, I'm trying to figure out how to have more sex with my wife. <laughs> with the woman that you just described, in no uncertain terms, is a really unattractive, gross person inside and out. And you're like, me want sex. Not good, dude. So a deplorable millennial, welcome to being a uh, healthy individual. On the other hand, I expect her to accept me as I am, asking over and over again for me to change. Maybe you want to flesh that out a little further, as I often say. How does she want you to change? You know, if she's telling you, please open up to me more. You're, you're a stoic rock of a person who will never talk about any kind of feelings. All you want to do is have sex. We never sit and talk, but then she's got a point. So what exactly is it she wants you to do to change? Let's start there. Um, Mr. Uh, I apologize. How did, did you say how to pronounce your name? 
Scroll, scroll, scroll. Rohan. Rohan. Scroll back down. Mm -hmm. I have custody of our two children, Rohan says. A week after our divorce was settled, she told me she's seeing someone. I got very anxious when my kids asked to go visit mom's friend. How can I better deal with it? Maybe, you know, here's the thing, dude. We, we both know that guy was in the picture before the divorce, right? I hope you're aware of that. Not that that matters at this point, right? But it helps paint a picture for what you're dealing with. Um, she's not thinking rationally. You don't bring a, a person like that around your kiddos. You have to know them for quite a while before you trust them and say, here's my kids. And guys, here's this guy who I, I know and I trust enough to introduce you very important children to. Um, it's, it says a lot to kids and kids grow up to be adults later and they'll roll their eyes and go, God, mom or dad. Um, there was just this revolving door of people coming in boyfriend after boyfriend. I remember one guy she had a boyfriend for two months. He was nice. And then he left and then the next guy came in. And what does that show? Mom is just this or dad again, or dad's not a gendered thing, uh, is, a uh, irrational, doesn't think things through, doesn't value us as children enough to keep those people away, just keeps introducing us to people. It's all about you know making her feel better and trying to get affection and attention and validation from other people to help with what the kids think and to help what's good for the kids. Not good. So she's one of those people, unfortunately. So you can state your case, and I recommend it doing a writing via text or email saying, um, I don't agree with this. You, by the way, I, I wish you all the best, ex-wife. I really do. I hope you have loving relationships and you meet the next Mr. Right and all that other stuff. God bless you. More power to you. But it concerns me that you're so quickly introducing this person to our children. Uh, frankly, you don't know him well enough. I don't know him well enough. Um, maybe after you guys have been together for a while and everything else, a year, give it a year, then introduce the kids. And I would like to meet him as well, just so I know who my kids are you know, seen on a regular basis. Um, put that in writing, but we both know how that's probably going to go. Probably a big old go fuck yourself from her, which is fine, but at least you got it out there, right? <clears throat> we got somebody from Saskatchewan. All right, Mr. Eric, welcome. Hmm. And Mr. Hyden watch says he's just trying to get the kids grown and out of the house and then deal with this one way or the other. Uh, how long is that going to be? Uh, good morning, Ralph from Saskatchewan. Confidence plays a major role in the dead bedroom. A confident man is an attractive man. Absolutely. I've noticed positive changes in my relationship when my confidence has improved. Excellent. Very good. Now, with that being said, is that solution for everybody? No. Um, th there, there is a, um, a contingent of uh, self-help type people, especially geared towards men, of which I am one, admittedly who preach uh, masculinity is a good thing right here, right? Go to the gym, work out, be more stoic. Don't be such a wuss. Don't be so needy. Uh, don't be so anxious. Uh, work on your independence and your hobbies and your interests. Oh, these are very masculine things, kind of boilerplate masculine advice. And I'm one of the big proponents of, of that. But I think where I differ from a lot is that there are some people who will literally, um, Keep taking thousands and thousands of your dollars for seminars and getaways and courses and everything else. Keep telling you, it's your fault, dude. It's your fault, dude. It's your fault, dude. Be more masculine. Be more alpha. Be more this and that. For some people, that's that's the prescription for sure. Um, I've talked to some guys who, dude, you got everything going on here. You just let yourself go, like physically. Um, you used to be, let's say, like a, you know, I knew one guy who was a, a swimmer at the collegiate level. Have you seen swimmers? Some good looking dudes, right? And uh, and then he's like, I'm married now. Now I sell insurance and I'm going to gain 200 pounds. And what the hell? My wife doesn't want me anymore. Have you tried, you know, having some semblance of the old you? And he does. And voila, wife says, thank you for whoever told you to go back to your old self. Thank God. She didn't have the balls, so to speak, to tell him, hey, you're gross. But that was a big part of it for them. That's them. Some may say uh, you're you're a very pushovery guy. You're not confident. You don't make any damn decisions. Um, I'm I'm tired of playing the the part of the boss around here. That's some people. Sounds like that may have been in part your deal. Well, for others guys, um, women are human beings just like us men. Us men are capable of some pretty awful shitty things. 
We do awful shitty things to hurt good people all the time. And women are no different. Some of you out there watching this or listening to this are married to some people who just do not have any business being in a relationship with another human being. And yet you're stuck with them and you are paying the price. And no matter what you do, that situation is never going to improve. Whether it's you or whoever you slide into your place, that situation is never going to improve. And some of you need to yank your head out of your ass and realize that and get the hell out of Dodge because it's basically killing yourself. Some of you, not all of you, dare I say not most of you, but some of you, that's the situation. You need to look at it situation to situation. So I don't like a lot of boilerplate. Just raise your confidence and everything will be fine. And then I got some dude out there who's married to some woman who's you know schizophrenic, to use an extreme example. And I, I've had a couple of guys where I've like, you know, what you're describing to me, dude, sounds like paranoid schizophrenia or something along those lines. This poor woman needs professional help. And he's, no, I think if I get six pack abs, I don't think, like, oh God, dude, no. And I realize I'm in part responsible for that, some of that because I put out some of that information. So I'm going to try to be a little bit more careful about that. Um, all right, here we go. In your world, the dad started in our world, I guess, uh, do you see more marriages or divorces slash breakups? Well, I guess in my world, more divorces and breakups because that's who I'm attracting. There's a lot of people that are going through that, right? Um, now, as far as, excuse me, new marriages, I guess is what you're saying. Do I see a lot of new people getting married? Yeah. Um, I'm I'm here in, you know, Kentucky. And it's not unusual for people to get married at, you know, the ripe old age of like 20 or something like that around here. You see that a lot. Right out of high school or whatever, get married. Have kids, not unusual. So, but if I were like in New York City, let's say I'm in Brooklyn, probably not going to see a lot of that there. Um, not saying one's good, one's bad, whatever. Yes, I am. It's not good to get married at age twenty. Sorry, um, but uh, I, I see a lot of people get married around here. A lot of young people. But in my little dad starting over world, yeah, a lot of divorce. Hmm. <laughs> uh, deplorable millennial going back to uh, how is it that his wife says, I want you to change? He says, uh, not sure how to explain. Um, I feel that she projects her insecurities. So it's super confusing. No, it's not unusual. She will change what she says off and on. Also not unusual. <laughs> um and Mark says, interesting, he had the same experience when his wife's father passed. We're going back to several uh, uh, messages ago where somebody said uh, they noticed an increase in sexual activity after their wife's father passed. And it's, it's like a, so we're pointing out that for some people, a tumultuous emotional event like that can uh, raise the need for connection with their spouse, maybe in some kind of quasi libido increase. Who knows? But it's, it's a, a known psychological phenomenon. Uh, akin to the old hysterical bonding. And then Ryan says, same story here in regards to uh, the previous message about uh, somebody moving on real quick, their ex-spouse. It's the same story here. She had a guy who moved in before the ink was dry on the divorce decree. I understand that she has a lot of childhood trauma. Uh, she always needs to have someone around because she doesn't have the confidence in herself. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's big of you to recognize that, and uh, it is not excusing it, though, is it? But it's helping to understand it. And this is a, a lot of pushback I get from a lot of guys, is I will say something to the effect of, uh, you know, a lot of people do something like commit infidelity, for example, or divorce or whatever, for the following reasons. And they will be like, F their reasons, they're shitheads. They're evil people. Who gives a shit? Well, okay. I see your point. And I can see a lot of you guys are hurting. A lot of you guys are fresh into this world. Been there, done that. But uh, it helps to understand it. Why? So we can avoid it in ourselves. So we can avoid it in future partners. So it just helps to learn these things. Learn human behavior. We're, we're better off for it. We're more well-rounded, uh, intelligent, educated creatures when we learn about all the little intricacies of how each of us, uh, what makes us tick. And Ryan says, yeah, I don't take it personally. It's not you, Ryan. Yeah, my ex and her issues, not me. It's her. And I genu genuinely wish her all the best. As long as what she does and what others do doesn't hurt others, 
does it impact the lives negatively in a negative way, others' lives, then um, do your thing, sister. Um, Jamond, G-M-U-N-D. I, I apologize. I don't know how to pronounce your first name. Is the G silent? Mund? I don't know. Uh, he says, my psychologist uh, recommended to leave my wife after 20 years. We have two kids and she has not cheated, but she does not want to continue being married. But she will not leave because she does not have a place to go to. Oh, okay. Uh, see this one all the time. Uh, my wife, you know, a, a man will talk about all these actions that his wife does that are really, really negative and basically push him away, get away, get away, you know, sometimes overtly physically get away and sometimes in an emotional way. Like I, I've detached from you emotionally get away. And uh, here's me and, and therapists and others saying, in essence, you've been dumped, dude. And the guy's like, well, if I've been dumped, what's she doing sticking around? We had to talk about divorce. And she's like, I don't want a divorce. I'm like, well, why not? Obviously, she's done with me. Well, dude, for a lot of people, divorce is a big honking thing that will really throw a grenade in the room of their life. And um, you represent a lot of security, comfort. They know what's going to happen today, tomorrow, and the next day, and the next year, and so forth. If suddenly you're gone... Goodbye safety and security. Goodbye comfort. Goodbye knowing what's going to happen next week. That's scary for a lot of people. So um, especially for people that are, um, and this is more often than not women. Sorry, not all of you. I'll pause here while you leave your comments. <laughs> but for, for a lot of you, a lot of you gals, um, when you're in later years, monogamous re relationship of 10, 20, 30 years, postmenopausal, a lot of you kind of uh, uh, resign yourself to the sexual me is gone. That part of me is dead. Um, and that's just cool. And the follow-up to that is, which is not very healthy, is, and he's just going to have to live with that. Sorry. Oh, sure, Mr. Horndog, 50-year-old here is ready to go at the drop of a hat, and I still catch him looking at all those gals, and I can see that he's still a, a sexual creature, but I'm not. Oh, well. And, uh, and then you're like, well, what are you doing in this relationship? I'm like, well, that's not, the relationship's not just about the old in and out. It's all the other stuff that goes with it. So I'm cool with eliminating that part, the romantic part of our relationship and all that goes with it. Not just the intercourse, but all the other stuff leading up to it. We can, we can ditch that. The cuddling, the snuggling, the hand holding, the kissing, the nap done. Yeah, yeah. I can go without that. Um, but I kind of need a roof over my head. I kind of need food in the refrigerator. I kind of need to see my children. I kind of need, I kind of need, I kind of need, and on and on and on. So, yeah, we need to stay married. Hmm. When, I, when I say it out loud like that, it's not the healthiest dynamic in the world, is it? But that's reality for a lot of people I'm learning over the years. A lot of people. And Mark says, because she's not done with the lifestyle that you provide. And it may not necessarily be, Mark, um, he provides, meaning he makes all the money and without his money, she will, you know, be destitute. No, a lot of these women are high paid women that they, they, they do well for themselves. Even if the guy looks at it on paper and he's like, I don't know what the holdup here is because she makes more than I do and she'll be just fine on her own. She has a, I don't want her 401k and all her savings and all the other shit. She can keep that stuff. And Hell, I'll give her the car. I'll give her this. We've talked about it. But she's like, no, 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 no. Why? That comfort, the security, that knowing what's going to happen. That's, that's huge for a lot of people, man. To throw her out, even if she's got you know, nice high six-figure whatever and a Mercedes and stuff, to say you're on your own, to some people, beyond frightening. And they can't take that next step. As silly as that may seem to some of us, some of us more independent types. <clears throat> All right, Mr. Allen from Facebook asks, do you think that cohabitation before marriage will lead to divorce? No. Or if cohabitation is short, or if, pardon me, or if the cohabitation is short, will the couples make it? So in other words, do I see some kind of premarital cohabitation leading one way or another to the demise or the strength of the relationship? No, I'm not really Mr. Conservative in that way, where two people don't live together unless you're married, damn it. We're all adults here. Um, one thing that cohabitation does, though, 
don't shoot the messenger. There's a lot of material out there all about this exact phenomenon. It's not necessarily just cohabitation. L- let me put it this way. A lot of guys that I talked to, um, everything was great. Everything was romantic. Everything was hot and heavy, as we say, meaning sexual. Uh, we were very interconnected emotionally, intellectually. Everything was great. And then she wanted to take it a step further. And she says, uh, I don't feel like we are serious enough yet. Uh, it makes no sense that you pay rent, I pay rent. We're paying double. We live 10 minutes from each other. Damn it, let's just move in together. And the guy says, she's got a point. We've been together for quite a while. All right, let's do it. And they move in together. And the guy says, I'll be damned. As soon as we become like this comfortable couple, the sexy knob went from here to mm, just ever so slightly here, slowly but surely. And I noticed that it keeps cranking down a little bit. Familiarity breeds contempt. Have you heard that one? Absence makes the heart grow fonder. You've heard that one too. These are very old sayings that are grounded in reality. It seems like the more we are around each other, day in and day out, the more we see all our little foibles and all our little annoying things, the more the mystery is gone, uh, the less that, that passion begins to dissipate. Just one of our little quirks of human nature. We want what we can't have. And when I don't see my missus for a few days, whatever it may be, it increases that uh, tension, that positive emotional tension. And when you see each other, it becomes an event. We're going to get together. This is going to be fun. It's going to be sexy. It's going to be romantic. Yahoo. No, man, I got to, I got to say goodbye. I'll, you know, I'll see you later. That seems to be the template for keeping the passion alive in many people. And so when you say, let's live together, you're saying goodbye to all that. And then when you throw on top of that, let's get married. More and more certainty is piled on. This isn't a uh, hyper-masculine, red pill, horseshit thing. This is a human nature thing, guys. There's books written on the topic by women. Miss Esther Perel, for example, is famous for saying something to the effect of, um, oh, how does she put it? It's, it's escaping me right now, something to the effect of, uh, uh, with certainty, passion leaves when certainty enters the picture, something to that effect, which for a lot of men, especially the way our libido operates, which is basically like, here's our libido. Hey, we got married ever so, ever so slightly down, but then it continues. (laughs) It's like, we don't care. We're ready to go. Um, so to hear, uh, a woman saying, no, as soon as everything gets kind of certain and comfortable and for sure. And the, and the, the mystery is gone. Then we go from here to here. We're like, what the fuck? That's why it takes work to keep that going. A lot of work. Um, so that's one way cohabitation in a nutshell can kind of uh, throw the grenade in the room, so to speak. I'm scrolling. I missed a bunch of comments while I was blabbing. Happens a lot. All right, here we go. Wordsmith, our buddy Wordsmith, a regular from YouTube. Thank you so much, Wordsmith. Uh, my wife said that I act like I don't want to spend time with her anymore but wouldn't say why. So she wouldn't say why she's thinking that. When we spend time together, she she says I act annoyed. It's a comfort test, I believe. Not sure how to feel about that. All this comfort test, shit test, blah, blah, blah. It's a hyper analytical, almost autistic way. Pardon me, I don't mean that in an offensive way. You know where I'm going, a spectrum-y kind of thing. Hyper analytical engineer type of way of looking at it. Hmm. What's going on? What's going on here under the surface when my woman says this? Maybe you should just take her at, at her face value here. And when she says, you know what? You don't act like you like me anymore. Why is she saying that word, Smith? Dude, man to man, you and I have been speaking via these things for a while now. It's because you don't like her anymore. <laughs> I've seen your messages. You don't like the woman. You have a lot of disdain for the woman. And the, the case can be made, rightfully so. You guys, you've been disconnected for quite a while. And she's been resilient to your advances for quite a while. And you have a lot of stress going on in life. And so here she is going, I don't know, it doesn't seem like you want to spend time with me anymore. And when, when you spend time, it seems like you're annoyed by me. She's just calling out what she sees, dude. Don't try to overanalyze this. Maybe you should say, yeah, I'm annoyed. Yeah, I don't like you very much anymore. Why is that? Well, dummy, it's because this. What are you afraid of? You're going to hurt her feelings? It sounds like you already have, dude. Put it out there. Be an adult, man. Step up. 
Yeah, I'm not happy. This is why. <clears throat> Let me scroll back here because once again, I got a follow up question to something. Uh, all right. This is follow up to Jimund. Po apologize if that's not how to pronounce it. The, uh, he originally said the psychologist recommend that he leaves his wife of 20 years. She's done with the relationship, but she won't leave. And she's told you as much, right? Uh, and I'm scrolling back to his follow up question. Uh, says, so should I kick her out? And be seen as the bad guy. Kick her out. Why not just be an adult and shake hands and say, we both know this isn't working, sweetheart. You know, I wish you all the best. Now kick her out. I don't know where you're at in the world. I don't know if that's a possibility. I don't know if that's legally possible. Here in the U.S., you can't just say wife out. She'll follow up with the police or the attorneys or whatever, you know, real quick saying, no, no, you out. Or uh, you figure this out legally and you end up staying in the same house. Just split amicably, dude. Your wife doesn't want to be in the relationship. Often, and you're pointing out something here, so often in, in a lot of these relationships, um, not always, the woman doesn't want to play the part of the bad guy. I'm done here. I've been done here. The safety security thing concerns me, but also what I'm much more concerned with is uh, what is everybody going to think about me? What are my kids going to think? What are my family, my friends going to think? They're all going to think of some kind of witch. Because he's not a horrible person. We don't have like a contentious, abusive, whatever. I'm just done with him. And I've been done with him for a while. I can't be the one to blow this all up. Let's just cross our fingers and wait for him to do it. Go ahead. Be the bad guy. So what? Yeah, I'm the bad guy. I can't believe he divorced her. Eh, believe it. Next. I, I Mr. G-Mund, I, I have the uh, luxury of not giving a shit what other people think. Sorry. I'm almost 50 years of age. I've gotten to that point in life where, eh, fine, I'm a bad guy, whatever. What do you want, what do, you want to do about it? Why? Because I know the truth. I know what's really going on. Let other people think whatever they want to think. Oh, well, no biggie. Hmm. Wordsmith follows up to his previous question saying, I am annoyed that 90% of what she says to me is about the kids. She's annoyed because I don't think about them 24-7. I've lost 100 pounds. I'm hitting the gym. I'm kickboxing. I have other things in my life. That's a very common sentiment amongst the men and women. Women tend to be um, very hyper anxious and uh, ruminating all about the uh, lives of their kids. And uh, us men just, we, what do we worry about? Stuff that's immediate and may cause us danger, life or death things. Otherwise, it's just, Background noise. We only have, and I've used this analogy before, we only have so much room on our plate. Our plate in our brain, if you will, is like the, the one of those paper plates that has the different raised sections to keep everything separate from each other. You know, the peas over here, carrots over here, meat over here, and they don't touch. And there's no room for anything else. So when somebody comes over with a spoon of something on our plate, we say, whoa, let's look at this first. What is that? She goes, I just want to talk about it. And you're like, no, nah, not plate worthy. Beat it. And we just ignore it which is often why uh, our wives talk to us about something. And you go, huh? Since when? And she says, we were just talking about this yesterday. You don't remember? And you're like, if you're honest with her, you would say, oh, no, I tuned out about two seconds into your speech because I don't give a shit. I don't give a shit about the red carpet, or what color of, of red carpet to get, I, maroon, bright red. I, I, I don't give a shit. So I ignored it. Sorry. That's the way I am as a dude. Now, if somebody's knocking at the front door and they have a gun or whatever. Oh, I'm at attention. I'll, I'll murder for my family, but I don't give a shit about 90% of the stuff that's said. Um, so that's not really shit, shitty of me, but it's true, isn't it? Um, it's part of what makes us charming as dudes. <laughs> so you have to, every little thing that goes on with the kids, the wife is, is thinking about the other day. Uh, my wife picked me up at the office and, uh, we're going home and I look over at her and she had a genuine, like this look on her face, not like her really. And I was like, you okay? What's up? And she's like, Oh, I'm just thinking about what to make for dinner. She says this over what to make for dinner. And I'm just like, don't you, didn't you already pre make a bunch of stuff earlier in the week for, so we could avoid such drama? Didn't you bake a bunch of stuff already? Yeah, I know, but the, she doesn't like the the muffins, and, and she won't eat the dead. Just on and on and on, ruminating about all this stuff. And it's like, <sighs> now, 
some women are have enough relationship experience and so forth to realize that yeah, it's just the way dudes are. We only worry about certain things and we you can count on us for the big things. But as far as all those little things, whether they're kid or not, we just we don't have the capacity for it. We don't care. And uh, they do, which is in part why they drive themselves nuts. <laughs> they they volunteer for everything. They just keep piling on more and more stress relating things. And it sometimes it takes us the dude in the relationship to go time out. No, we're not dealing with that. Take that off your plate, wife. It's silly. Or I got it. Give it to me. I'll take it. You worry about the 19 other things. I got that one thing that's causing you less stress or whatever. Um, but for some of your more anxious types, um, a common thing amongst a lot of anxious types is I'm anxious about the fact that you're not as anxious as me about fill in the blank. Doesn't this bother you? Doesn't this worry you as much as it worries me? And when the other person goes, it's no big deal. Oh, that just drives them nuts. Like, what do you mean? No big deal. This is a life or death thing. No, it's not. Cancer is a life or death thing. Whether or not we have two dozen cookies or three dozen cookies for the bake sale tomorrow. I don't give a shit. There's my speech on men not really giving a shit. <laughs> and Alan says, uh, Romeo and Juliet never cohabitated. That's why they were passionate. Oh, well, there you go. Um, Guys, we were already almost at an hour. Oh, that went by fast. And I wanted to keep this to about an hour if I could, please. So I'm going to say any other last minute questions. Dad starting over, dadstartingover.com. Check it out. Dad starting over any of the social media channels. Check out our private group for men only, the DSO fraternity. Once again, for men only. Sorry, ladies. Um, check me out on YouTube. I got going up, it'll be 900, it'll be 1,000 videos here soon up on YouTube. And you're never going to run out of shit to watch because I keep adding to it every single day. Uh, podcasts, the DSO fraternity, I didn't mention. Um, I mentioned the, the live meetings that we have on there and we, we record all of them. And then you can in turn listen to those from your phone, from your podcast app on your phone. We give you a little link and you click it and it adds, adds our meeting archive meeting recordings feed, if you will, to your podcast app. It's kind of cool. Shows up as a podcast, but only members can see that. And um, we have now over 700 hours of meetings on there. Holy crap, that's a lot. So if you like to listen to podcasts, got a lot of road trips, walking on the treadmill, working out, pick a meeting, hit play again. And by the time you, you think you've made a dent in the meetings, we've just added more right behind it and right behind it. Same with the DSO fraternity. Um, what else? My audio books, all of them right there from your phone. So if you're an audio content kind of guy, DSO fraternities right up your alley. If you like to talk and discuss forums and so forth, right up your alley. If not cool, it's not for everybody, but uh, we would love to have you. Let me see. Bradley says, thank you. Always insightful. Well, thank you, Bradley. I appreciate it. Um, Alan says, are you a DJ in real life? No, I am not. The voice is something I've had to work on. Not really, I guess not my natural voice, if you will, but it's something I've had to work on over the years. Um, I was a DJ in high school, believe it or not, and college. Um, so I think that maybe planted the seed for how to properly enunciate. Um, the radio station when I was a kid was called WQTY. QT. And the, I remember the guy telling me it's W, not W. W-Q-T-Y. And then I was at Indiana State. W-I-S-U, Indiana State University, Terre Haute, Indiana. <clears throat> so there you go. So a little bit. So maybe that has stuck with me for the past 30 years. Wow, I'm old. Anywho. But thank you for that. Appreciate it. All right. And if you like my voice, I do the readings of all my audiobooks. Audible, DSO. Check them out. Dead Bedroom Fix. That's my biggest seller. In addition to... Uh, Divorce Panic, in addition to Red Flags, which is a quick read or listen. And then uh, Real Talk, No Bullshit Life Advice for Young Men is, just like it sounds, a book for young men. All about uh, all, all the shit that we wish somebody had taught us when we were a kid. I've had a lot of grown men read that saying, actually, this is a book for me. I like this. Um, uh, tough to get our teenage boys to sit down and read a book or listen to it, but uh, I've had some. And I've had some good feedback. I've had uh, one guy say he actually was on a road trip with his kiddo and said, we're going to listen to this together. And they did. And the guy, the kid was like, I like it. I want to listen to this part again. Love it. So check it out. Real talk. No bullshit. Life advice for young men. All right, ladies and germs. I thank you all once again for joining me. One hour on the dot. There you go. Perfect. 
dadstartingover.com. And uh, I put uh, in the chat earlier, in the comments earlier, scroll back and see it, links to uh, one month for free to our men's group, the SO Fraternity, as well as a coupon code. If you decide to join, uh, you can get the annual, or pardon me, the lifetime plan for a whopping 30% off. That's in honor of our fourth anniversary of the group. All right, ladies and germs, always a pleasure. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your Thursday. A toodaloo.